thank you for that introduction. Um, and thanks, Theodosis, for that um, presentation. That was super interesting. Um, so um, I'd like to also thank the organizers um, for taking, uh, for giving me the opportunity to spend some time today talking about my research. Um, I'm a third year PhD candidate at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, my larger research explores international intervention in Bosnia and particularly the relationship between peacekeeping and humanitarian assistance. I'm particularly interested in how language is used as a way to define problems and create the parameters for differing frameworks for intervention uh, in the conflict in Bosnia, 92 to 95. So today I will be presenting a portion of my research related to the language used by the UN Security Council during the Bosnian War. In looking at how the UN was describing the actors to the conflict, I posit that it's possible to see a confused narrative being produced by the Security Council at the same time as they were calling for decisive action in the former Yugoslav Republic. I also posit that through a close study of the language of the UN, it is possible to track the evolving legitimization of the armed wing of the Serb Democratic Party from a paramilitary unit to an internationally paramilitary unit of the internationally recognized Yugoslav National Army to an independent military organization of a recognized government. This legitimization mirrors the evolution of the SDS leadership as provincial extremist organization to key partner in the international peace process. As I've spent my life ensconced in the recent ish history of Bosnia, uh, it's always a challenge to find a balance between providing enough background for my analysis to make sense and not so much that the audience dozes off. Um, I've yet to find that balance, but um, I'm gonna try again here and give a, a brief history of Bosnia. So in the spring of 1992, the government of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina called a referendum on independence from the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The Democratic Party, led by future war criminal, criminal Radovan Karadzic, called on its supporters to boycott the vote. The nature of the boycott holds a vague place in the literature. Some sources describe it as a largely traditional boycott by Bosnian Serbs in a way that presents an image of a unified bloc of ethnic voters. Other sources speak to violence and coercive measures being used by the SDS to block Bosnian Serbs from reaching polling places to vote for the independence of Bosnia. In the end, despite the boycott, approximately 60% of eligible voters voted and they voted overwhelmingly for Bosnian independence. Um, this was at the beginning of March. Um, by the beginning of April, three things happened simultaneously that signaled the beginning for a long hard war for Bosnian civilians. The European community recognized Bosnian independence. The SDS in turn declared the independence of a breakaway state um, of the Republic of Srpska with its government in Pali on the outskirts at, on the outskirts of the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. And the SDS laid siege to Sarajevo. The ensuing war in Bosnia, which lasted until November 1995, when the Dayton peace accords were signed, was marked by extreme violence against the civilian population and the genocide of the Muslim community at Srebrenica. The general policy of ethnic cleansing and the implementation of siege style warfare throughout the former Republic led to a complex humanitarian crisis that was complicated further by competing authorities on the ground, competing narratives at the international level about the nature of the conflict itself, whether it was an intra or international war, and a hesitancy on the part of the international community to define an aggressor. As the war progressed and the United Nations established six safe areas in cities that largely housed, sorry, largely housed pro-government civilians, there was debate about the role the United Nations Protection Force, the peacekeeping uh, operation, should and could play in protecting those civilians nominally under its care. In July 1995, the safe area of Srebrenica was attacked by SDS forces. UN peacekeepers, paralyzed by a mandate that limited their actions to protection of self and humanitarian supplies, watched as an estimated 8,000 men and boys from the Muslim community were removed from the safe area. In the coming weeks, the International Committee of the Red Cross worked with those families left behind to find the missing men and boys. As I'm sure many of you know, those who were taken from Srebrenica were murdered outside of town in an attempt to destroy the Muslim community in Bosnia. By the fall of 1995, NATO airstrikes against SDS military targets had been approved, and in November, the Dayton Peace Accords were signed by representatives of the Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian governments. Bosnia itself was split into a federation and the Republic of Srpska was codified as an administrative unit within the independent state. In the hopes that that very brief history of the conflict was enough uh, and not too much, um, I'll turn now to the project at hand. So to understand the role of language 
the role that language played in defining the conflict and the framework for intervention that the UN Security Council that ultimately led to the mandate that prevented Dutch soldiers from intervening on behalf of civilians facing genocide, I needed to understand both what language was being used in resolutions and what the geopolitical situation, geopolitical background for those resol resolutions were. This process is ongoing. Um, I anticipate that my understanding will change and evolve as I turn my attention to other sources and other organizations that are part of this study, um, including the International Committee of the Red Cross, Renaissance Sans Frontier, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And I have to chart the use of language and visualize these trends. Uh, I've entered all the terminology that's used to describe actors um, into a database. Um, and as I've worked through this process, um, two trends have become clear um, that I'd like to discuss further here, as I believe they have implications for how the early framework for intervention was constructed in Bosnia. First, uh, there's a clear call to protect minorities without clarification of who is a minority in the Bosnian context and in the context of war. Um, and second, the language used to describe the SDS armed groups undergoes a period of legitimization as they move from paramilitary forces to authorities. So firstly, the definition or lack thereof of minorities. Uh, on May 30th, 1992, uh, nearly two months after the conflict in Bosnia turned violent, Security Council Resolution 757 was adopted, which stated explicitly the need for effective protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms, including those of ethnic minorities. Though two weeks earlier, the Security Council had called upon the belligerents to cease any forced movements of people with the aim of changing the ethnic composition of a community, they had yet to define the ethnic composition of the territory, nor had they articulated what demographic constituted a minority in Bosnia. Throughout the Yugoslav period, Bosnia-Herzegovina was routinely determined to be the most diverse republic with the highest percentage of citizens who identified primarily as Yugoslav. Bosnia itself was an aberration within the Yugoslav Republican model as it was a republic without being a recognized nation. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, Sorry about that. Uh, so this is in contrast to Serbia, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, Macedonia, and Montenegro, which are both republics in the administrative sense, as well as titular nations as defined by the federal government. One could be a citizen of Macedonia while also belonging to the Croatian nation. Conversely, Bosnia was understood to be strictly political without having a complementary nation. As such, a citizen of Montenegro could not claim on the census to be ethnically Bosnian. The adoption of Muslim as a census category in the 1970s was, uh, was a response to the disparity that many Bosnians felt within Yugoslavia without a larger nation with which to belong. The continued comparatively high adoption of Yugoslav as an identifier on the Republican census can be partially explained by the general diversity among the population of Bosnia, as well as the complicated relationship between Republican citizenship and national citizenship as it played out in Bosnia. This multi-layered understanding of belonging, citizenship, and related political rights is offsided as the catalyst for violence in the region. It is partially from this codification that the narrative of ancient ethnic hatreds arose as an explanatory model in the 1990s. Historians, journalists, and commentators alike often point to Tito's forceful suppression of nationhood as an artificial calm amongst historically warring parties. When he died, the school of thought argues, latent ethnic tension, tension simply re-emerged as the primary driver of Balkan politics. As such, the violence of the 1990s became considered merely a continuation of conflicts that had been done with previous generations. Resolution 757 plays into this simplified narrative when it, re when it references the need to prioritize minority protection without defining what that means in a, the context of the Bosnian War, the time of independence. On the eve of war, the population of Bosnia was just under four and a half million people. And according to the 1991 census, the last before the war, 43% of Bosnians identified as Muslim, 31 as Serb, 17 as Croatian, and five as Yugoslav. The remaining citizens identified variously with other Yugoslav constituent nations, European nations, or as other or unknown. Taken literally, Resolution 757 demonstrates the desire of the Security Council to, pr to protect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, Yugoslavs, and other minority groups within the newly independent and Bosnian majority, Bosnian Muslim majority state. It is important to note, however, that the context of the entirety of the resolution seems to imply something else. In the preamble to the resolution, the council reaffirms and recalls that no territorial gains or changes brought about by, the vi by violence are acceptable and that the borders of Bosnia and Herzegovina are inviolable. 
During the early months of the war, armed units of the SDS successfully captured over 50% of former Bosnian government territory. During this time, government forces were active, though their more limited military capabilities resulted in largely defensive actions throughout the country. Given this, it can, be, it can confidently be argued that the Security Council was referring specifically to territorial changes wrought by SDS forces. As the SDS nominally represented an ethnic minority in Bosnia, the later language of the resolution creates uncertainty about who the Council defined as requiring international protection. Census defined ethnic minorities or civilian communities experiencing violence. If we were to take Resolution 757 as a microcosm for resolutions related to Bosnia, and we are, uh, we can see how the discourse being employed reflected a confusion among member states about the nature of the conflict and their role in both facilitating a peace process and mitigating the effects of the humanitarian crisis. This leaves us with the question of who the Security Council deemed a minority and in need of international protection. And the results are largely inconclusive. As early as November 1992, the Security Council specifically named Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces as aggressors in the conflict and noted the particularly precarious situation of Muslim women in detention camps throughout the region. This characterization of the conflict reinforced the minoritization of pro-government communities and appeared to codify a macro narrative of the conflict. The macro understanding of military power can be described as a conflict specific narrative as it reflects a conceptualization of the overall conflict without regard for community level power struggles. Community level, level power struggles, struggles or context specific narratives recognize that in instances of communal violence, definitions of minorities and victims are contingent upon individual experiences with violence that transcend census categories and macro military capabilities. In this case, Muslim women, uh, in the in the census are a majority, um, but in the terms of context specific violence, they are a minority. Had the language of SDS aggression and government victimization remained consistent, the parameters for intervention would have been clearer. However, there was a confused discourse at the Security Council surrounding questions of protection priorities and how to define an intervention. This tension and confusion is best represented in moments when resolutions condemn, for example, all war crimes and other violations of humanitarian law by whomsoever committed, Bosnian Serbs or other individuals. This sentence articulates a conflict specific narrative of SDS forces being responsible for a larger percentage of violations of international law while also condemning context specific violations or community level violations. Without a clear definition of what experiences constitute a legitimate need for protection and how minorities are being defined within the war zone, the framework for intervention being advanced by the Security Council lacks structural integrity, and the consequences we're seeing at Srebrenica. One of the myriad challenges of any conflict is determining the legitimacy of the actors. Whether one believes an individual is a freedom fighter or a terrorist, or whether a group is a self-defense organization or a death squad, plays an important role in how intervention is conceptualized, rationalized, and operationalized. This process is not simple nor static. The language used at the macro level to define belligerents is not inconsequential. As FR Anchorsman argues, specific terminology is often used in the absence of an explanation. That is, we rely both consciously and unconsciously on a shared understanding of words to situate complex issues within context that help us to define the parameters of a problem and the possible solutions. To put it simply, when one, for example, defines a group as a self-defense organization, one is conferring a certain level of legitimacy on its activities and creating a context that would seem to necessitate intervention on behalf of that organization. Uh, when one defines a group as a death squad, on the other hand, there is an implicit understanding that such activities um, are illegitimate and that any intervention would not be on behalf of said death squad. To add to the challenge of determining legitimacy, the categorization of actors rarely remains static throughout the course of the conflict. As the conflict evolves, so too does the way in which international actors perceive of armed groups. Today, the international system recognizes Bosnia as an independent state. In 1992, it was a republic within a recognized state. When the war broke out, the rhetoric within the Security Council resolutions implied an understanding of the warring parties as those who either supported Bosnian independence or supported remaining within Yugoslavia. As such, uh, Yugos as such units of the Yugoslav People's Army are referenced alongside vague mention of irregular forces. In June 1992, the Security Council made its last reference to the Yugoslav People's Army in relation to the violence in Bosnia. 
This follows the announcement from Belgrade that it was withdrawing the People's Army, all units of the Yugoslav People's Army from all republics except Serbia and Montenegro. And importantly, we're renouncing its authority over any elements that remained in Bosnia. This represents a turning point in the conceptualization of the conflict at the international level. Though Belgrade's announcement made clear that the Yugoslav People's Army personnel would remain in Bosnia, they were working under a new authority. After the nominal withdrawal of JNA forces, Security Council resolutions do not explicitly name an armed force or group, but rather note the activities of all parties, all sides, or all sides and others concerned. At this time, the Security Council was clear that its top priority was negotiating a political settlement to the dispute. The hesitancy in the months between June and November to define what who the political parties were and what armed groups belonged to what political party in resolutions complicates the directives coming from the governing body. Being clear about who the international community views as a legitimate actor and therefore partner in the peace process is an important factor in building a framework for intervention. In November 1992, seven months after fighting began, the Security Council named a Bosnian actor for the first time by noting the role of Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces as particularly at fault among all parties in the Republic for refusing to comply with previous resolutions. The term paramilitary is nebulous and opaque because it refers to any armed unit that, in literal terms, resembles, is a part of, or alongside of a state-sponsored military. It is an umbrella term under which militias, private security firms, insurgent or separatist groups, and organized crime could all belong. The perceived legitimacy of paramilitary organizations can be challenging to define. The presence of paramilitary organizations in conflict since the end of the Cold War pose a serious challenge to both the security structure and the peace process. As the majority of paramilitary forces are considered to be informal, they complicate the incentive structure that negotiators rely on to reach a settlement of civil conflict. At the end of the Cold War, the shifting geopolitical environment and the belief that a new world order was at hand contributed to a delegitimization of par paramilitary organizations that were widely regarded to prolong conflict. In the early stages of the war, the reference to Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces speaks to a Security Council understanding that the armed wing of the SDS was not a standalone military. It must exist alongside a state-sponsored military, but what state? Belgrade had formally recalled Yugoslav National Army personnel, but in what must be one of the worst kept secrets in Yugoslav history, that did not mean the JNA was no longer involved in the conflict in Bosnia. The better armed SDS forces continued to receive armaments and supplies as well as personnel from partners in Serbia. As such, designating SDS forces as paramilitary speaks to the need for the formal peace process to involve the Bosnian government and Belgrade as a, um, uh, sorry, as a benefactor of the SDS rather than with Sarajevo and the SDS leadership within Bosnia and the Republic of Srpska. The armed wing of the SDS went through a most transformative change within Security Council resolutions in the months that followed their introduction as Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces. This transformation reflects the changing understanding of the conflict and the peace process by the United Nations member states. When the Security Council formalized the establishment of safe areas, explicit reference was made to all Bosnian Serb military or paramilitary units. This represents a significant change in how the Security Council understood the legitimacy of both the SDS as a political and military organization. While the continued use of paramilitary acknowledges that not all armed units were necessarily part of a state-sanctioned state force, the inclusion of military legitimizes certain units as affiliated with, a recognized government, with the recognized government of Republic of Srpska and therefore part of a formal peace process. As one of the hallmarks of the Westphalian state system is that a sovereign power has a monopoly on violence through the use of military or pseudo-military law enforcement, Resolution 824 elevated the SDS government to an equal party in the Bosnian political landscape and tacitly legitimized the violence of its military. The Security Council did not cease to refer to Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces after the May 1993 inclusion of military, However, its use was more nuanced as member states engaged in peace negotiations with SDS leaders on an international level. Resolutions began to favor the term Bosnian Serb forces over direct mention of military or paramilitary. The use of forces speaks to an understanding of all units working under the authority of the SDS political regime, as is used in Western military parlance, Canadian forces, American forces, Russian forces. By the end of 1994, the Security Council was referring to Bosnian Serb authorities, 
The transition from a paramilitary force to an authority in the country speaks to the changing attitude of the Security Council as it conferred legitimacy on the SDS as part of the intervention process. The Security Council needed to treat the government of Republika Srpska as a government partner, as a government par partner equal to that of the Bosnian government, because A, the SDS controlled the majority of the territory, and B, the SDS viewed themselves as equal partners. As the SDS comes to be viewed as more than simply a paramilitary unit of the Yugoslav People's Army, the language of the Security Council shifted to accommodate a framework for intervention that would eventually see the international recognition of Republika Srpska within the Bosnian Federation. So to conclude, language matters. Um, it helps us define not only the present, but also what the future will be. In the context of war, the language of war is translated into the language of peace. The framework for international intervention is built into the language of how conflict is described. When we are unclear about who requires protection, then our intervention will not adequately protect those who need it. When we confer legitimacy on an armed group, we are welcoming them into the formal peace process and validating their political aspirations. As James Waller argues, one of the most significant risk factors for genocide is a history of genocide. Historians can and should play a role in post-conflict reconciliation by interrogating the environment in which genocide and intervention occurred to understand the nuanced ways that social, political, and economic circumstances intersect to create the conditions for genocidal acts and their prevention. Mm -hmm.